now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult of propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The Apostle Paul warned us that our opponents in this cosmic or spiritual wrestling match are not human, and yet we Christians tend to de-supernaturalize our faith to the point that we don't understand why we're being injured as we're standing out there in the middle of a battlefield with blinders on. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me today is a woman who's got a unique testimony. She is an ex-New Age spiritualist who has been saved from that and is now warning others about the danger the encroachment of the New Age movement and this uh, alternate spirituality, which can only be called demonic, uh, into the Christian church. Um, she is uh, someone I've been aware of for quite some time, and uh, for some reason, one reason or another, we just never made connections until uh, today in 2017. We'll trust that the Lord had his reasons for this timing. Um, her website is OurSpiritualQuest.com, and we welcome to the program for the first time Laura Maxwell. Laura, welcome. Thank you, Derek, for having me on your show. Thank you. Um, this, uh, and by the way, I should point out to, for a friend of ours who watches all these programs, uh, Juan, who lives in Ayrshire. It's uh, nice. We, we finally managed to get one of your uh, one of your countrymen or country persons, anyway, uh, out of the program, and we're honored to do so. Uh, Sharon's homeland, her ancestors uh, were uh, from the clan Fergus, so we're uh, mm. doubly honored to have you on the program, Laura. Um, T tell us a little bit about your background. You call yourself an ex-New Age spiritualist. Uh, what, did, what did that mean? Uh, how, what, what sort of spiritual track or, or path were you on? Yeah, well, basically, um, my mother had always been interested in psychic phenomena and um, the possibility of contacting ghosts and the supernatural and so on, and like her, I was very much interested in the same types of things. Um, so she had had some psychic experiences as a child, as did myself. Um, obviously, she met my dad. They got married and had me. It wasn't until years later um, when they divorced that she felt free to really investigate that whole realm because my dad didn't really approve so I would be a kind of preteen age, and basically she was approached by a clairvoyant medium in the park while she was walking the dogs one day, and he recognised he could see, you know, he could discern that that she had psychic abilities and um, the ability to contact spirits and so on. So he actually invited her to the spiritualist church in Glasgow that he was a member of. Hmm. Of course, my mother was delighted about that, so she went along and joined. Hmm. It, and I went too. So what, what sort of psychic experiences did you, uh, uh, did you have as a young person? Uh, nothing too dramatic, just kind of mild experiences, really, like premonitions of things that would happen. Um, you know, conversations that would happen or people that I was about to meet or things that were about to happen in the news, that type of thing. Nothing really dramatic and nothing that regular, but we were aware of it and certainly wanted to develop uh, hmm. in that way. So we went to the spiritualist church. Um, they still have them in the UK and, and even just general spiritualist type meetings, um, whether you want to call it a seance or a meeting where channeling occurs. We were into all of that. And um, so, of course, in that in that type of New Age a paranormal community, certainly in the UK, and I believe it is worldwide, you know, they do recommend you, if you have these abilities, to, to go to classes and, and be taught and develop these abilities. Um, and what they would say, for example, would be, as well as going to a development circle and learning to, to channel, 
spirits or entities or angels or aliens or any kind of entities that may be out there. Um, they also recommended you do what I would say are new age type activities, for example, yoga and meditation, uh, certain deep breathing exercises. Basically, these were, nowadays are so common, I realise that, they're so mainstream, but when you go back, these types of things basically were um, used by people who, who were very much into the supernatural, who were very much wanting to contact spirits, and we were taught if you do yoga and if you do meditation, you will be uniting with spirits. It, it, you know, you can't do it and not unite with spirits. People who do it for relaxation and so on, they might say, well, I'm not interested in the supernatural. I just do it for relaxation. Yeah, but what you don't realise is you are actually uniting with spirits when you're doing this, whether you're aware of it or not. For example, the yogis themselves, they will say the, the first, the main um, function, purpose of yoga is to unite with the universal spirit. You know, they talk about the various Hindu gods and so on, millions of them. So you are connecting yourself spiritually, whether you're aware of it or not. I certainly found this out to be the case. And, you know, years later, when I did become a Christian, I had to have exorcism done understandably, because I picked up so many spirits. And one of the uh, quite frightening ones was actually a demon of yoga. It was a kundalini spirit. Hmm. Um, so there you go. The proof is in the pudding. You're not going to have deliverance if there's nothing there. <laughs> um, even though I didn't know I had demons, obviously. So, you know, we went along. We were very much um, engrossed in it all. We were into you know, learning about different healing modalities, learning about um, really everything I would class New Age, although nowadays it's so mainstream that you can hardly call it New Age because people just accept a lot of these things now. Um, but basically we were taught that the New Age movement, obviously it's always existed, we can go right back to the Garden of Eden if you like and talk mm -hmm. about the serpent, um, but certainly, <laughs> ye shall be uh, as gods. It's the oldest lie in the book. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But and it's always we've always had necromancy. We've always had people wanting to contact the dead, ghosts, angels. You know, there's always been that interest. Every culture, every age has always tried these things. We know that it's a very real, very powerful phenomena. It's not a uh, make believe. It's very real. And most of these people are well meaning. People are not, uh, certainly get no grudge with any of them at all. Um, I understand their interest in it. Um, but we were taught that in the 1830s, round about then, there was a woman called Madame Helena Blavatsky. Right, yeah. Very famous medium. And she was termed the, the mother of the New Age movement, basically because she was bringing it all more mainstream than we'd saw before, you know, up until obviously there was a time when witchcraft, for example, was illegal in the UK. Um, mediums could not operate. It was illegal. They would do it in secret. They would have seances, you know, in their homes. It couldn't be a public thing. Um, but obviously the Witchcraft Act um, was done away with. So, and Madame Helena Blavatsky, she really, her main mission in life was to bring the supernatural, um, the esoteric, the paranormal, right into society um, because she believed this would be a good thing. It would help um, the world. It would help bring peace um, and unity if we all just opened ourselves to spirits and, and learned from the spirits and the spirit guides, etc. cetera. Um, and if we'd done away with religions, it's cer certainly Christianity, um, and we really helped everyone to evolve spiritually. So she was a New Age mother, um, and obviously she had um, followers like Alice Bailey, for example, as well. And these people, um, I know some people might not believe this if they've not heard of it before, but top mediums do actually believe 
that Lucifer is God. And this is the crux of the matter that I really feel like I must always stress. They believe Lucifer is God, not Jesus. So they believe Lucifer is still the angel of light. He did not fall, as the Bible says. He did not become Satan. Christians are wrong. He is the redeemer type figure. It was him who descended from the planet Venus or wherever. He is the savior type. Um, and he um, welcomes any religion, all religion, all spiritual activities, all types of supernatural paranormal activities um, because he sees it as being there's always to God because he really is the God above all of it. And so such mediums like Blavatsky, Bailey, Today you have David Spangler, you have um, Benjamin Krem, you have Barbara Marx Hubbard, and so on. They still say the same. And the Lucis Trust, of course, mm -hmm. which was the Lucifer Trust originally, the Lucis Trust is still going. They're involved in education, they're involved in government, they're, they're quite high up there. They still promote this. So my mother and I believed that. Um, we believed Lucifer was God. Um, if you, anyone in the world anywhere had a psychic ability or they could speak to spirits or they could speak to angels or fairies or they could channel or they had the gift of magic or powerful, all of that we were taught, all of the sources of all of that power came from Lucifer. Hmm. didn't matter if you were a, a Hindu, a Muslim, a, a Christian, a witch, a Wiccan, whatever, your powers were actually coming from Lucifer, whether you realised it or not, and whether you wanted to acknowledge some other god or not, didn't really matter, it was Lucifer. Hmm. Jesus, no, that's all fabrication, um, and, and the Bible was all fabrication. So we were taught um, very much the agenda um, was to educate society about this, Um and we knew it was controversial, to, you know, to go about saying Lucifer is God's. And that wasn't really the main aim because it didn't even matter if they would know or not. It didn't really matter. The, the key was get as many people in society as possible to evolve spiritually, hmm. to come away from Christianity and so on, to evolve spiritually, get into meditation, get into yoga, get into psychic abilities, start channeling, whatever, because... The main crux of the matter was all about the age of Aquarius in the latter days. Um, the, the earth needs peace, it needs unity. And um, to cleanse the earth, as it were, we need this collective consciousness. We all need to raise our vibrations. Um, Christians especially are very low um, spiritually. They're very low evolved, you know, they need to get into this as well. We all need this spiritual evolution where we advance. Um, and basically, I remember being taught, you know, we're, at, we're approaching the end. Um, it, it will be wonderful, you know, this new dawn and everything. But before that, there's going to have to be a cleansing of the earth. The majority of people on the earth are actually going to die. Mm. And, and that, you know, you can find that in these people's writings, if you don't believe me. Um, yeah, Barbara Mux Hubbard is uh, basically said as much that uh, the, the, uh -huh. the, that essentially Christians are holding back the uh, evolution of the human race because of our uh, poor spiritual uh, development or or whatever. We're, we're an Absolutely. obstacle that needs to be eliminated. Uh, and, and I believe that you know I believed, and I remember thinking, oh wow, that's a shame. All these people that they're, they're going to get killed or. Aliens will take them, spirit guides will take them, or they'll just be killed. And that's really sad. But we were taught, but it's okay, don't worry about these people. They'll be reincarnated. They can come back <laughs> again, and next time they'll get a chance to join us. And they'll be like, oh, well, okay then. I didn't realise then that reincarnation itself is a demonic lie. Um, that If people have past life regression, my mother and I were interested in that mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and you think you've had previous lives because you get visions of it, etc. Again, we, we now have proof and evidence that is actually demonic demonic lies put into your head to take you down that path. Any of these things that I've mentioned, basically to keep you away from Jesus Christ as being your saviour. 
and to put you under the umbrella of anything that is under Lucifer's domain. Which is basically yeah. anything else. He don't really care what you believe as long as it's not the one thing is true. Yeah, and interestingly, you know, when people are attacked by demons or so-called aliens from other planets, it is the name of Jesus Christ that, that chases them away. And if they are looking for devotees and they're looking for a, a, a person to channel them, they will often say to the person, don't use the name of Jesus Christ. Now, why would an alien or right, yeah. a spirit guide say that? You know, yeah. Unless there's something wrong with the name of Jesus. Well, why is there something wrong? And that's what my story um, really focuses on. Um, so what was it? Uh, in, in fact, you, you answered a question I was going to ask, which is how people in the movement uh, view Christians. Because I've heard from uh, another uh, former New Ager who's gone home to be with the Lord, a fellow named David Duncan that uh, Sharon and I interviewed a number of years back, who actually uh, had a teacher of his that he met in 1967 at Haight-Ashbury. I mean, he was right there in San Francisco during the Summer of Love. Uh, and this fellow manifested, basically became a being of light and came over to a group of them you know, three o'clock in the morning or something and said, I am Lucifer. And, you know, David believed that uh, that's what he was seeing. He was seeing a manifestation of something calling itself Lucifer. Um, but he said that while he was part of the movement, uh, he understood that Christians, like practitioners of the New Age, were also uh, essentially practicing magic through prayers. It's just that Christians are too stupid to know that that's what they're actually doing, and so their magic is really weak. Um, uh -huh. and, and you kind of addressed that with the, uh, the, the attitude that uh, you know, Christians are an obstacle to humanity's evolution, and so they must be eliminated in order for humanity to take the next step towards fulfilling that lie from the garden, that we shall be as gods. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, though, what was it then that convinced you that that... Um, that the path you were on was the wrong one. Well, basically, I believe what you've just said, and and you know, we we knew the New Age spiritualists. We believed in a sense we were a, anyone, if it, whether it was Freemasons or, or or witches, we all were. It was all a kind of brotherhood, sisterhood, um, that we were in, and that yeah, that the Christians were holding back, as it were, um, Lucifer's, um, you know, full. Uh, reign here and stopping him bringing peace. Um, well, interestingly, you know, that reminds me of something I'd like to put in before I forget. The, the night my mother began to be attacked by spirits, hmm. and the, the night where it got really bad, she actually um, started calling out for help for all different kinds of gods, all different kind of spirit guides, any kind of spirit she could think of. And an, an angel came in the room who was absolutely beautiful and he was really shining brightly and she knew instantly it was Lucifer and she was so grateful because she thought he's finally come to help me um, but when he got to her close up she realised he wasn't good at all he was utterly evil the, the sense of evil from him was horrific she was terrified and she knew he wanted to kill her that was Lucifer hmm. um, and she's, for the first time, she shouted out in the name of Jesus Christ, and he disappeared. Um, so, yeah, sorry, you asked me what... Well, basically, it was because we began to hear um, so many rumours through the grapevine that, that many channelers, mediums, psychics, sometimes ran into difficulties with spirits. They sometimes got attacked um, by their so-called dead relatives or spirit guides or ascended masters, um, and they couldn't um, protect themselves any longer. So that began to happen to us. Hmm. It was one thing being attacked by spirits because the mediums um, would explain to us, well, sometimes you get a mischievous spirit comes through. You know, it's a hazard of the job. But when it was meant to be your personal spirit guides um, who'd always been good to you for years or your dead relatives... You know, why would my grandmother suddenly turn up and try to choke me, strangle me, make me paralysed? Why would my uh, so-called sister start turning up and being vicious? That doesn't make sense. Um, basically, we began to realise it was dangerous. It got worse and worse. Uh, my mother, she 
um, was attacked all the time. She went to the doctor and asked for sleeping pills because the spirits were constantly coming through her, including the night. She could no longer control it. They would take her into trance when they wanted to, not when she wanted to. Mm. And they, even, they even forced her into trance outside and picked her up and threw her onto traffic, moving cars. Wow. They put her into trance in the kitchen one day uh, and she burnt the food. The whole kitchen was up in flames. The kitchen was ruined. We could have been killed. So they were taking over control, basically. And my mother and I wanted out of the movement. We wanted out of spiritualism. And we couldn't get out. The spirits didn't want us to go. We tried all the advice the mediums gave, and we loved the mediums. They loved us. We were good friends. You know, I don't have a grudge about these people at all. They tried their best. And it got so bad that the doctor, you know, said to my mother, I don't believe you can hear voices. If you're being thrown around the house and, 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 and in danger, you're a danger to yourself and others. I believe you have schizophrenia, and I need to put you in a psychiatric hospital. Now, that was a great personal shock to my mother and myself, as you can imagine. But again, we'd actually heard this does happen to, to mediums and channelers and so on. It's not new. Um, so, yes, she went in there. Now, it was around about the time when she was in there that I actually met a Christian um, at university, and I told her the situation, and she invited me to her church, and she said, Jesus Christ can help you. I didn't believe that because, as far as I was concerned, she was pretty stupid. <laughs> Jesus Christ was um, a medium, a reincarnated saviour of a previous saviour of pagan days. You know, I didn't believe the Bible. So, But she was so nice, and I thought, well, she wants to help, and um, I went along. Um, basically, the, 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 the guy there just really touched me by what he said and, and also the atmosphere in the place and the Christians there, they were speaking in tongues and this really, really grabbed me, the speaking in tongues. If you are a Christian and you speak in tongues, don't be afraid to do it with your new age friends because they're likely to love it, as I did. Remember, new agers are used to supernatural things. So if you do something supernatural, that actually gets their attention. Ah. And it certainly did for me. And... Um, also the sense of peace and the sense of, obviously it was the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus I was sensing. I didn't know that at the time, but I knew something was different here and I knew it was making me fascinated and I wanted to know what's going on. When I got home, however, the spirits were not thrilled at all and they attacked me. I kept the lights on all night. I was terrified. They, they wanted to kill me and I knew that. So I opened the Bible and um, I basically prayed and asked, you know, if Jesus is really as the saviour, if if what I'm doing is somehow wrong, you know, can you show me? And I did get a scripture from the Old Testament that, that basically was a scripture about spiritualism and necromancy and attempting to contact the dead and how it was actually wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I was really shocked and upset at that. Um, just couldn't believe I'd been so deceived. But I was kind of still in two minds, and I kept thinking of this um, medium. She called herself a Roman Gypsy. I had it sore for a few years. I kept thinking of her. The next day, the very next morning, she came to my door, and she said, basically, Jesus has sent me to you to hmm. tell you I'm no longer a psychic. Um, I'm no longer a medium. I have become born again. My psychic abilities have all gone. Um, I, I'm born again, and wherever you went last night, that's Jesus, that's your path. That's So I was like, wow, huh. that God sent an ex-medium to confirm to me that he is real. Wow. So, yeah, I, I, I got born again quickly after that. I asked Jesus into my life, and I threw out everything, um, esoteric, paranormal, all the books, everything. I burned them, actually. Um, I told my mother she wasn't thrilled at first, of course. She thought I was a traitor. Um, but, you know, she was in a psychiatric hospital. She was desperate. And um, my new Christian friends were, were nice and friendly and, and kind to her. And she wanted somewhere to go at the weekend. She was allowed out at the weekend, obviously. 
So I would take her to the church on the Sunday and um, slowly, you know, she began to warm to, to them and, and to Jesus. She did get born again. She improved so much um, that the psychiatrist released her to go back home. But bear in mind, Jesus does say you need to cast the demons out. They don't just disappear automatically the moment you get born again. If that was the case, whenever you see people getting born again, maybe in a church where they all go down to the front and they all say the sinner's prayer, each and every one of those people would start manifesting. Demons would all come out of them automatically. You know, and you don't see that hmm. because it's not an instant automatic thing. They need to be cast out. Now, the church I was in then was quite a new church. The pastor was quite a young man. He's now into the deliverance ministry, probably after what he saw with me and my mother. Um, but in those days, he was new to all. He didn't believe in demons or, or that Christians could have a demon. And therefore, um, he just thought my mother and I were both mentally ill <laughs> for claiming to still be getting attacked. I was still getting attacked by demons, even though I was born again. My mother was. Now, sadly, this got to such a stage that my mother could take no more and she killed herself. Oh, my. Um, you know, and I always stress that as well because it shows the importance of the deliverance ministry, the importance of Christians need to acknowledge these things exist. Many pastors don't seem to realise it. Many leaders in the churches don't seem to realise it. But what does the Bible show? You, you can cast demons out. And that's been 20 plus years ago since that happened to me. Um, and constantly I'm told by people worldwide who are in the exact same position I was in a way back then and who did come to Jesus but had still problems with those demons until they found someone who would cast them out. They often would go around lots of churches looking for help until they finally found someone. Um, so I just feel it emphasizes that, the need for um, deliverance. And um, yeah. The the thing that, that's amazed me, and there's a reason I opened the program by referencing Ephesians 6.12 and Paul's warning that we're not wrestling against human opponents is because it seems to me, and of course, as I mentioned before the broadcast, my, my background in, in the church is from a very liturgical, almost spiritually, I wouldn't say dead, but at least spiritually dry uh, church upbringing where uh, Jesus was held up more as an example. This is how you should live because you'll be happier if you do. Well, yeah, that's true insofar as that goes, but it doesn't address the situations like yours where um, you've basically been on the other side of that fence. And since becoming involved in, in what Sharon and I are doing, which for me has basically just been trying to figure out the way the universe works and using a background in broadcasting, you know, I've got no spiritual gifts that I'm aware of uh, other than just a, a psychological need to tell people what I think and using a microphone. Um, but I've met a number of people like yourself who have come out of the New Age movement and people who I now consider to be uh, very close friends. These are rational, productive people that you can depend on in a, in a crisis. Uh, these are not people who are psychologically, emotionally fragile people. Um, so they 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 are believable you know i believe their testimonies and believe their stories and so uh, even though i have not experienced it and i'm certainly not asking for this kind of experience because it doesn't sound like fun uh, i believe that it happens and certainly when i read the bible we see examples of this sort of thing happening over and again i mean uh, we we certainly aren't told in scripture that the activity of the spirit realm, the demonic realm, ended at the end of the first century, at the end of the apostolic age. There's no reason to believe that it ended. And yet uh, there are many pastors out there, like as you experienced, um, as, as our friend Russ Dizdar has testified, who, who seem to have the attitude of the, uh, uh, the, the priest from the movie uh, The Exorcist, Father Karras, who said the church stopped believing in demonic possession when we discovered the science of psychiatry or psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that seems to be the, uh, the, the path that your mother was, uh, doomed to follow. It, it seems, uh, doctors who didn't believe her story and so committed her to a, uh, to a hospital instead. Um, and so we see the church in this modern age in the Western world, um, 
ignoring stories like yours, ignoring the testimony of the missionaries that we send to parts of the world where the spirit realm is very real, like Africa, um, you know, people who will come back and say, you wouldn't believe some of the things that I've seen witnessing amongst, you know, the, the peoples of Africa. Well, no, that doesn't really happen. That's just, you know, what they believe in. Yeah. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing practices that are inviting these spirits into our church. You mentioned yoga, for example. I want to go back to that because this is a hot topic in uh, churches. I've got a good friend from uh, where we used to live in Illinois who was uh, <laughs> given, as we call it, the left foot of fellowship when he dared speak out against yoga when a women's group in his church began holding weekly yoga classes in the church. Um, they were invited to go elsewhere because they would rather get rid of uh, one of the uh, volunteers with the youth than lose the yoga class, apparently. Um, what is it about the yoga uh, practices of the yoga? And, and that what is this kundalini spirit for people who are not familiar with those terms? Yeah, you know, it does concern me, and as you say, there's so many. I, I think that a lot of pastors and leaders over the generations, they've compromised, they've you know, scripture, they no longer view the Bible as, um, you know, the, the inerrancy of, of scripture. They're, they're more likely to look to other things in the world, to look to man's opinion um, than to follow scripture. Uh, like and pardon me for it. interrupting, but this this happened from your neck of the woods just recently where the Church of Scotland said that the church's teachings on um, same-sex relationships has to be viewed through the uh, the, the, the lens of, of history, and that uh, when Moses brought this law down from Mount Sinai, this was because he was part of a patriarchal culture that saw that, uh, you know, homosexuality was a bad thing, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, sadly, um, for the Church of Scotland, that is uh, historically ignorant. When Moses came down from the mountain, God gave him this law, and all of the, pro the prohibitions against certain types of um, sexual activity that are in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus were put in there because those are things that the cultures around the ancient Israelites were doing. It's what the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the the the, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and all they they were engaging in this sort of activity. What, well, exactly. what we're being told today is progressive behavior is actually regressive because it's going taking us back to an age before Moses. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new under the sun. Amen. Um, yeah, and whatever is happening today in the nations and in the culture. Yes, it will be in the church too, and we do see a moral um, decline, worldwide, and a spiritual decline. And yes, it is going back to those days of old. It's not anything new. And yes, back in those days, those people you listed, they were practicing things like um, divination, witchcraft, spiritualism, attempting to contact the dead. Um, but they were also into sexual orgies and so on, and even sacrificing their own children. All of it, you know, right, often right. went hand in hand. Now, your, your average New Ager is not uh, doing all of that. No, no. But these practices are um, demonic. You do open one, two spirits. And, and yoga, as I say, it was designed by the yogis. Um, you know, if, if you, I know people who were born and raised in India who um, were. Hindus and, and from generations of Hindus um, or, or Sikhs and so on. And, and yeah, they, they were taught that, that, that yoga, it, it was to unite you with these these spirits, you know, the, the Hindu gods and so on and, and the, the, the universal spirit, as it were. You know, if you speak to perhaps um, those who come from a, a generation of, um, say, Native Americans, Indians, shamans and so on, these kind of a folks, again, um, will have various forms of whether it's meditation or, um, you know, really going into yourself, even like the mindfulness of today, for example, really shooting everything out, going into yourself and, and being open to the spirits. Um, again, as I said, it's, it's something that's always existed in, in, in the world and, and down all the different ages and, and cultures. And yes, it's crept into the church and... I, I can't understand why the church doesn't see it. I really don't. It's as if they're not reading the Bible. Uh, they're compromising. They're thinking it's not relevant for today. But on the other hand, when you look at society, you see how popular witchcraft is, how popular we saw when um, Donald Trump became president. 
so many folks didn't like it that they that they were quite open about casting spells mm-hmm. against him, using witchcraft against him. We see the phenomena. We hear so many stories of people having poltergeists in their house or the terrible things that have happened to them through Ouija boards and so on. The demonic is real. You know, demons are real. The occult is real. The demons didn't just go away um, after the Book of Acts. You know, <laughs> of course they're still here. We still have dark, very, very dark occultists who still use those demonic powers. Where are they getting the powers from? It's from demons, um, and, and the church is is ignoring it. Um, but yeah, yoga, as I say, uh, and meditation and so on, they were very much encouraged um, by those wanting to channel or get in touch with spirits. And yes, Christians will pick them up too. I know of Christians who have got into such things unawares, and they've later realised they've had problems when they've tried to read their Bible, when they've tried to pray to Jesus. Spiritual stuff has happened, and they've thought, whoa, what's going on? And they've needed deliverance, and the demons had to be cast out of them. The curses were broken, and then they found themselves back into um, the, the spiritual light and, and love of Jesus that they had known, mm-hmm. that had been blocked for a little while whilst they were doing these occult practices. Uh, you know, and that's the, the proof in the pudding. And again, also the whole thing about ghosts is so, so common now. Even many Christians are, are, are into ghost hunting now, see right, nothing wrong right. with it. They want to. Uh, record spirit voices by EVP recordings and so on. But again, you know, what does the Bible say? When people die, look at the, the story of the rich man um, and, and Lazarus, you know, uh, Luke 16. When people die, they either go to heaven or hell. There is no reincarnation. There is no ghosts uh, coming back to visit or trapped earthbound spirits. The Bible shows us... Um, that these entities are demons masquerading as if angels of light. They can masquerade. Demons can shape shift and look like your dead gran. They can shape shift and then one minute it could look like your dead gran, the next minute it could shape shift and pretend to be Michael Jackson that wants to give you a message. You know, they can do that. Um, and again, people worldwide have contacted me who have maybe saw me on TV or whatever. Mediums as well, people who people who are not Christian have heard this and they've thought, right, I want to test out what Laura said and see if this is true. And the next time their so-called spirit guide, ascended master, Palladian from another galaxy, star seed, angels, whatever, ghost, comes to talk to them, they challenge it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to show me your true identity. Mm-hmm. They challenge it with the cross of Jesus Christ, with the blood of Jesus um, about Jesus being the saviour and the only one that can save us from our sins and truths like that from the Bible. And the majority of times, I would say 99% of the time, the people say, yes, that so-called entity morphed into the demonic true form mm-hmm. and it left at the name of Jesus. Uh, the couple of times where it's not happened, um, I suspect it's because the person didn't want to see the truth Um or they were so heavily involved in the old cult and they had such a generational curse from the family line that them challenging the demon in the name of Jesus wasn't enough. What really I would like to see happen is for someone like that, that a few born-again Christians come and do it with them, challenge mm. the entity in the name of Jesus Christ, and they will see um, it, its true identity. Yeah, our friend uh, Joe Jordan, who is the... Uh uh, founder, co-founder of CE4 Research, which stands for Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, uh, has uh, encountered hundreds of testimonies, has uh, collected hundreds of testimonies of people who uh, were experiencing a- what they believe to be alien abductions, and, and yeah. has found that they've been stopped by calling on the power and authority uh, that's in the name of Jesus. Um, you mentioned something I want to come back to, because this is something that's become more and more uh, accepted in mainstream uh, in the world of education, and that is mindfulness. Uh, it's showing up in a number of schools, not just here in America, but in the UK as well, as a tool for teachers and counselors to get children to calm down. Uh, they, they've, they say that this is an effective tool to uh, get children, uh, to, to help children focus and to uh, release their anger and their, their, their aggression against one another. Um, what is mindfulness, and why should we Christians be concerned about it? Yes, well, basically, um, 
you know, we are going to find right up until the last days, right until the end, there will always be some new healing modality. There will always be some new fad, if you like, coming along. And really, I would say, look at the, you know, the, the roots of it um, and what, what it's all about. Don't just accept it blindly. You know, with the mindfulness, similarly with, with yoga and meditation and things like that, often it's ended up in, in education, it's ended up in schools, hospitals, um, the, the health professions. And again, remember when I said we were taught the agenda, the new age agenda of getting all of this into society so that people would be affected by it, they would be able to tune in to, to spiritual vibrations, whether they knew they were doing it or not. So really we were forcing our beliefs on them. You know, you go to a hair salon today, you go to a physiotherapist today, a lot of them are now trained to lay hands on you and, and, and bring healing to you, whether you've asked for it or not. Huh, yeah. You know, it's just the way of the world now. It's very, very common. It's very much part of the agenda. Um, New Age, even the Illuminati, ex-Illuminati members will tell you that, like Carolyn Hamlet, who you may know, um, she would say the same kind of thing. Um, as I do, it was very much to get society along this spiritual path. But, you know, whether it be, I remember people would ask me whether it's mindfulness or a while back people said, what did I think of Pilates, hmm. for example. Again, look to the person who came up with that. Joe Pilates was really into yoga, for example. Um, so where are their spiritual powers? Where are the spiritual sources of these things coming from? Now, things like, you know, calming down and calming your mind and, and watching what you focus on, and that in itself is, is, is good, you know. Um, psychologically, that is good. Of course it is. But you've got to remember the people that are bringing this, when they're doing it, they are doing it with the focus of calming your mind, emptying your mind, emptying your mind. When you empty your mind, it is akin to an invitation to spirits to influence you. Whether you know it's an invitation or not, it is an invitation. The same if you were to start doing yoga or meditation, you are giving out an invitation to the universe to mm. come and relax you, to come and bring its energies to you. Energies are not just energies, they have a personal, they are personal, and basically they are demons, and there's so many stories of people who have discovered that that it just can't be a coincidence. Um, mm. Well, the thing I think is, is fascinating is that the, uh, the secular world of, of uh, science and medicine will, will look at the effect of prayer, uh, for example, and uh, they will talk about the, uh, well, we, we can document the positive um, physical effects of, of prayer, but they attribute it to the practice of quieting the mind and, and focusing instead of the fact that you're actually in communication with the creator of the universe, you know, with the, you know, God almighty and with Jesus Christ and the Holy spirit, you're, you're tapping into a supernatural source of, uh, uh, the, the, the peace that passes all understanding. Uh, and that's why people in hospital who pray tend to respond better to treatment and they seem to be in better moods. Uh, I've even read one, uh, one academic paper that talked about how uh, people who pray are nicer as though that's something they can actually observe and quantify scientifically. But what they're finding through their research, and this was, uh, I believe, a researcher from Brown University here in the U.S. Uh, within the last couple of years, found that people who were participating in transcendental meditation workshops and, and uh, were, were finding that they were actually, uh, it was having the opposite effect from what was intended. They were actually experiencing more anxiety and distress and physical uh, uh, side effects, um, uh, some even driven to the point of uh, suicide because of things that were that, that uh, and they but they can't figure it out because they're looking at it through, you know, blinders because they're dismissing the possibility that the supernatural realm has any effect on these people and that what they've done through opening their minds, inviting these spirits in is inviting demonic oppression, if not possession. Uh, yeah. But of course, when you're looking at it through the lens of science, where nothing exists that, I mean, if we can't observe it and quantify it, it doesn't exist. So the supernatural realm is right out. That has nothing, no bear. They can't figure out what's going on. Why is this meditation that should relax people 
having this these these negative effects to the point where people are having psychotic breaks from meditation. Yeah. It's uh-huh. because of the demonic realm, but they don't see it. Mm-hmm. And sadly, because mindfulness is being introduced into our schools for school children as a way to relax them and get them to quit fighting on the playground, you know, uh, Christians need really need to be aware of this. And it, to me, it's shocking that this has gotten so far. Um, yeah, we- and I, again, you know, uh, it was certainly something that, that we were into advocating all of these types of things because we believe that in the last days that the, the children will be raised up or many of the children will be indigo children they will be special children simply because we have put all this on them put all this on them and um, opened them up so spiritually they will come away from the the faith of their parents and they will all help lucifer's light increase so yeah the the, the children will be the ones that are targeted um and because the children have had their parents and their grandparents and their parents have been involved in all of this new age activity too, they will be really, really tuned in um, to the demonic um, because of all the ancestral curses they've had in the first place. So children of today will be so spiritually attuned to things that maybe they wouldn't have been a few generations ago, and it's just because of the influx of uh, the demonic um, teaching that, that, that is put on people now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's uh, and I just had a disturbing thought because uh, and I wanted to come back to this uh, quickly before we because we're, we're getting close on time here um, uh, to ask you again about uh, Kundalini and what that spirit is. But some years ago, I interviewed a, a gentleman named Andrew Strom, who was part of the, uh, uh, the the charismatic movement here in the United States and charismatics in, in, in general. I don't have any uh, issue with this when you go past the point of discernment and that any manifestation of the supernatural realm is considered evidence of the Holy Spirit and. He was part of the uh, the Kansas City Prophets movement here in the U.S. Um, and I won't name names because I don't want to make this a personal thing between me and people who believe that they're they're following the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, may genuinely be saved, you know, followers of Jesus Christ. But th- there is a belief among certain elements of the hyper charismatic movement in the United States that a select group of children are being raised up, and they've gotten. They're they're labeled with different names like the uh, the, the new breed, the the Elijah generation, uh, the Phineas priesthood, uh, and, and so forth. The idea dates back to the early '50s um, and the origins of the uh, the latter rain movement um, and a belief that uh, a a group of spiritually supercharged overcomers would be empowered with uh, essentially superpowers to defeat um, defeat the, the enemies of, uh, of the church, enemies of uh, evil, uh, or the, or, well, the evil enemies of Jesus Christ. And, and it almost sounds like the, the flip side of the coin that you're describing among the New Age movement, that these children, these indigo children, would be raised up with these super spiritual powers to uh, help take mankind, humanity, to the, to the next level. Uh, again, this just sounds like a Christianized version of the same thing. And Andrew Strom uh, actually called it the, the, uh, uh, the, the influence of Kundalini on the church. And that's why he left it, because he saw what was happening was not uh, biblical. There was no precedent for it in Scripture. And it was the manifestation um, of demons in the church who were being welcomed as the Holy Spirit. Uh, is you know, am I on the right track here? Or am I am I am I connecting dots that that shouldn't be connected? Well, I, I'm concerned about a lot of what goes on. Um, you know, I certainly had deliverance from a Kundalini spirit when I needed deliverance from yoga. Um, and a lot of folks who have done yoga don't know that. Remember, they believe there were chakras mm-hmm. all over their body. So a full deliverance is needed. It's not enough to just say, I repent of yoga. A full deliverance of each of the chakra points and, and all of that stuff, demons out of each of those, because they're entry points. Each of those entry points need cast out. Um, so, you know, and yeah, these things are real and I've noticed that, as you say, Christians will be very much, if something happens, they'll just automatically believe it's an angel that Jesus has sent or it's the Holy Spirit. They're not testing it. You know, the Bible says test everything, test prophecies. 
uh, test of spirits. Right. Um, you know, and if they're not doing that, they're, uh, they're just assuming that it's coming from God. Therefore, that they are uh, more open to deception. If an angel turns up and gives them a message, you know, they just take it as of, oh, yeah, that's that's good. They're not testing it. Um, a, a lot of them are, are, are feeling that um, angels are with them all the time and constantly talking to them. Um, well, that's not new revelation and so on. The Bible doesn't say that's going to happen. And you've got to look at um, the consistency. In the Bible, when angels did turn up, it was for a very specific, a very important reason. Mm. They didn't ch- turn up, you know, just for a little chat. Um, but nowadays, some, some Christians are feeling that that's what angels are doing. They're basically turning up having a bit of a chat with them. That's mm-hmm. not um, what, what angels did in the Bible. Why would Jesus suddenly turn it and make angels act differently? The so-called angels I've heard um, a lot of Christians talking to today are turning up and, and, and hiding things in their house or, or stealing their cup of coffee. And I'm thinking, what? Well, that's not consistent with an angel. In fact, it sounds a bit more like a poltergeist. Yeah, but, yeah. But demons will do anything. You know, if, if you suddenly start believing in ghosts or believing in, they will they will fulfill that thing that you want to do. They will they will go along with it until you call them out on it, until you uh, test them on it, because they don't care. And, you know, these so-called angels, um, if you notice, some of them have even got very non-biblical names, actual quite new age names. And again, the Bible says, test it if an angel comes, even if an angel comes and gives you a message that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, ignore it. Let them be um, cursed, is what Paul wrote. Let them be anathema. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So yes, I believe many Christians will, along with New Agers, along with you know your average person, will uh, start to trust these beings more and more. And 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 I think for years their message will be a, a good message that will they will give them like yes, follow Jesus Christ, blah blah blah. It will seem to be biblical that the advice they're giving. But then I think we'll see the turn when it will become um, the more one world religion, if you like, and these so-called angels that are talking to Christians, similar to the spirit guides and the Pleiadians and, and all that are talking to the New Agers, will end up giving the same message. Jesus is not the only way to God and that we should all religions should should unite. We should all worship together. I think that's the way that is going to, um, to go. So I do think it is, it is very dangerous what, what we're seeing in some um, Christian churches, the things that I've heard that some uh, deliverance ministers are even doing things like recommending people use sage or they have a, a holy bath. For <laughs> really? And special water to help cleanse you. You know, that is stuff that uh, some witches do, some paganists do. Why? You know, it doesn't tell you in the Bible. No, it doesn't. To do that. Now, again, if they do that and it does seem to work, then they will say, but it works. And I would argue, of course it works. It's supernatural. Demons will do stuff. Of course it works. Yes, the sage will seem to make the demon go away, and there's your proof. But the demon hasn't really gone away. It's hiding. Yeah, yeah. It's tricky. It knows you want to believe in the sage. It knows you want to believe in these false exorcisms. So it will go along with that. But it's still in your home. It's still probably even in your body. It's still affecting your family, whether you know it or not. And it's still putting that wall between you and Jesus Christ, your fellowship with him is not as strong, is not as important as it could be. And therefore, again, you will be more deceived to going along with the eventual one world religion. Yeah, which is going to sound very, uh, very open. Yeah, it it sounds very open minded and very loving to say we should all get along and we should all be part of this one big happy family. But uh, that's not the path that Jesus laid out. I mean, Jesus said there's one way. I mean, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. That's uh, well, that's pretty intolerant. Well, yeah, but uh, he's God, so take it up with him. Mm. It, is, it does sound intolerant, but you know, what I've mentioned is under the umbrella of Luciferianism, and Lucifer truly is actually Satan. He is evil. He does want to take you to hell, so he's quite happy if you follow any of the things we've listed today, because he knows it will take you away from Jesus, and he wants you to go to hell. Um, that's what it boils down to. And, you know, your dead grand cannot come back and contact you. She's either in hell or in heaven. That's what the Bible shows. And, you know, that is the purpose for whether you're a Christian or not. 
that these so-called ghosts or, or whatever you're talking to angels or fairies or whatever is to distract you from getting closer to Jesus, really close to Jesus, because we're in the end times, we're, you know, in perilous times, the closer to Jesus you are, the more you will be able to survive what is coming psychologically or maybe even with your life. And if you do lose your life, you're better to be with Jesus than the side of Lucifer. Amen to that. Uh, Laura, where again, your, your website, ourspiritualquest.com, is, is that the main place people would go to follow your work and to read your uh, read your blog and, and, and so forth? Yeah, that's the main place. It does have also my YouTube videos, uh, my own TV, my own radio show, different TV shows that I've done and, and et cetera. And, and there's even some deliverance ministries listed there that people might want to look at if they, they see the need. Mm. In the UK, and I know that we have a, a gentleman I've interviewed in the past who's a friend of yours, Michael Cummins. Um, uh, who, who else might you recommend for people in, in the UK especially? Yeah, Michael Cummings, he, I met him through Revelation TV about seven years ago. He is a very selfless man. He literally takes phone calls like nine in the morning to ten at night from people he does deliverance over the phone. He never charges money. He's not interested in that. He's just, he, he, he sees such a lack of deliverance ministry in churches that he's just dedicated his life to just full-time deliverance ministry. Um, Michael, I know I can't think at the top of my head. There are there are various deliverance uh, ministries out there, and I would just suggest people look, you know, Google um, their own town, their own city, whatever country you're in, and see what deliverance ministries are out there. Try and do a little bit of research, though, because some of them might be a bit flaky and they might be using trying to just use sage or, or whatever. So, you know, do, do be careful um, and pray about which one to be led to. And again, you know, there's some deliverance ministries today they're born again deliverance ministers. They are definitely casting out demons, but they're also believing that sometimes there are ghosts. I've met deliverance ministries like that, and I've said to such deliverance ministries, in all humility and in love and gentleness, I've said to them, please, I, I know you believe that, and I know you're practicing that, that you're sending ghosts onto the light, but please test it. The Bible does not give a precedence for right. the existence of ghosts. And those deliverance ministries... Honestly, Derek, have got back to me and said, Laura, I tested it and I discovered those so-called ghosts or demons and I know. Yeah, yeah. So you, you just got to test stuff with, with the Bible. we got to get back to the Bible is, the scriptures are the word of God and not just um, take from what, what the world is teaching us. And my people perish, perish through lack of knowledge. Right, right. Yeah, the the uh, prophet Hosea would be uh, would feel very much at home in uh, modern day uh, the UK or the United States. That's for sure, because uh, yeah, we are perishing for lack of knowledge. Uh, there's research here in the United States just with, within within the last year that 60 percent of American Christians, people who b say they believe the Bible, believe that God is real, that Jesus Christ is His only Son, uh, who died for our sins, 60 percent don't believe that the Holy Spirit is real or that Satan is real. And, uh, 60%? Yeah. So if you don't believe the enemy is real, then the need for a Savior isn't quite so important because Satan's just a concept. It's just a representation of the evil that's, you know, that men do. It's like, <laughs> and uh, in the latter days, many will abandon the faith and yeah. begin to follow the doctrines of demons. And we are seeing Christians taking up a lot of esoteric beliefs and practices now because they're thinking that, you know, it's okay. Doesn't really matter because the enemy's not really real after all. It's just uh, you know the stuff, the bad stuff that we do to each other. That's what this uh, all represents. Laura Maxwell, ex New Age spiritualist. Her website is ourspiritualquest.com. Laura, we thank you very much for sharing your story with us, and uh, we hope to talk with you again. Thank you, David. Good wish. Check the show notes at vftb.net. That's View from the Bunker, vftb.net, for a link to Laura Maxwell's website. I'll also put that link. Below this video, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, it's youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert. And uh, by the way, if you're new to the YouTube channel, please check out the playlist that's labeled or titled The God, or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the Great Inception. Check out the one called The God Conspiracy 2. That's my novel, the audiobook version of my novel, The God Conspiracy. But check out The Great Inception. That's the new book. And uh, it's a series of about 30 videos, all between 5 and 10 minutes long, each dealing with a single topic and um, recorded at uh, Morningside Church in Blue Eye, uh, several different presentations I've given on the book. 
um, which documents how the Bible is a record of this long war of rebellion by the small g gods created by God. Uh, And I know that use of the word gods, small g gods, is um, a little weird for us English speakers. But uh, look, in the Bible, God calls them gods. Yahweh, big G God, calls them gods. Exodus 12, 12, when he goes through Egypt on the night that he slays the firstborn as a punishment against uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, he executes judgments on all the gods of Egypt. He didn't say, I'm going to destroy these you know, lifeless blocks of wood and stone. He was executing judgment on the gods of Egypt. Psalm 82, he describes these supernatural beings that he placed, apparently, over the nations after the Tower of Babel. Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. Deuteronomy 4, verses 19 and 20. Um, and condemns them for judging unfairly, for ruling and by showing partiality to the wicked and condemning them to death. A day is coming when the gods will die. That's already been decreed. And so they're a little ticked off, which could explain the state of the world today as the gods of the nations uh, try to take as many of us with them as they can on their way to the lake of fire. Uh, Anyway, all of those presentations, which uh, I think will show you that the Bible is a lot more interesting than we thought it was when we were kids. Uh, you'll find those at the uh, YouTube channel as well, youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert. A couple of things really quickly I want to talk about uh, because it just shows that fake news is not limited to, this, uh, to the political realm. Uh, this past week, a couple of stories that got a lot of attention, one that's just breaking today, Friday the 28th, um, but the one from earlier this week that uh, was circulated around via Facebook, I received it from a number of people, talked about it on Tuesday on Skywatch TV. Um, we talked about it, uh, Sharon and me, on uh, Sci Friday. Josh Peck, by the way, sat in on Sci Friday for this week uh, so he could talk about uh, a new type of weird particle called the angel particle, which is both matter and antimatter. That's like mind blowing. Anyway, this uh, report that came out was reported by uh, the New Zealand Herald, which cited another article. Um, and the claim is that new research shows that ancient humans had sex with non human species. Non human species. This was a, a study by an assistant professor of biology from the University of Buffalo. Okay. Now, Sharon graduated from Indiana University with a degree in molecular biology. She graduated with honors, an emphasis in genetics in her, in her biology degree. Um, by definition, if the genetic sequences that they've discovered in these um, samples taken from sub-Saharan Africans, okay, they took genetic material and sampled the DNA DNA of humans living in sub-Saharan Africa and found what he called wildly different genes. And this professor believes that the genes can be traced back about 150,000 years when ancient humans were breeding with this mysterious ghost species, a non-human ghost species, so-called because they haven't found any physical remains of this species yet. So because we don't know what the genetic material is, it must be non-human, And because we don't have any physical remains, we're calling it a ghost species. Well, of course, people are asking, oh, is this proof of the Nephilim? No, no, it's not. Um, Doesn't mean it's not proof of the Nephilim. I do believe the Nephilim existed. Um, I'm not, I don't believe that they walked the earth today. But I believe that, uh, you know, they certainly existed in years past. But the fact that this genetic material is showing up in the people today, remember the Nephilim were pre-flood, okay? And they were wiped out in the flood. Now, there was a second incursion. I agree that that's biblical as well. Um, But to say that there's Nephilim DNA walking the earth today, we don't know that. Can't really prove that. And the fact that this assistant professor of biology and, you know, other experts can't identify what these genetic sequences are. I mean, they're, they're finding that what used to be considered junk DNA, useless DNA, actually isn't junk at all. It actually does stuff. It's just we don't know what it is. Not completely. So to make this statement, to make this claim, is not really making a valid uh, scientific claim, not one that he can document or support. It's basically the kind of claim that a uh, researcher makes when they're trying to attract attention to get funding. Yeah. So... um, 
of course, there are others, non-Christians, who will argue that this is proof of um, alien contact. You know, ancient astronauts, no, no, it's not. The, the, look, the human body, okay, does not allow, doesn't deal well with foreign intruders. If it, it sees protein coat on a, on, a, on a molecule or a cell uh, inside the body, that it recognizes as foreign, as an invader, it triggers an immune response. So in the female reproductive system, when an ovum is confronted by non-human sperm, it's, it's, it's like having a key that doesn't fit the lock. It's not going to enter the egg. It's not going to, it's, it's not going to uh, uh, fertilize. So, you know, to say that, the, in other words, by definition, the fact that this genetic that these genetic sequences, this wildly different genetic material in the human DNA of people living today in sub-Saharan Africa, the, the mere fact that it's in their DNA means that by definition, it came from humans. Now, this uh, uh, assistant professor, and I shouldn't say that like that's a pejorative. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's qualified. He's got his degree and all that. So anyway, I'm not trying to disqualify the source. I'm arguing with his analysis of the information, okay? Um, his contention is that uh, humans were crossbreeding with other um, species called hominins, which are human-like or proto-human. But in 2004, a Professor Hanneberg who is uh, considered a world-renowned expert anthropologist from the University of Adelaide in Australia, studied the 200 existing skeletons, and I, I was surprised there were only 200, 200 existing skeletons of hominins from all the collections in the world and found that when you measure the differences in skull shape, skull size, skeleton size, and so forth, that they all fall within the bell curve of the range of sizes you find in modern humans. In other words, his conclusion was, they're all human. Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Cro-Magnon man, Neanderthal, all Homo sapiens. All human. Which again makes sense from a genetic standpoint. This wildly different genetic material is only material that we don't yet recognize. But the fact that it's in the human genome means it is human. Now, the second story is one that uh, came out today, and I'm seeing this at a number of places that ought to know better. The headline reads that uh, DNA uh, disproves or counters biblical account of ancient Canaanites. The story is that researchers tested the DNA extracted from human remains recovered from ancient Sidon or Sidon. That's, um, you know, the, the uh, coast of Lebanon today. It was a Canaanite city. These remains are thought to have been buried about, these people were thought to have been buried at about 1700 BC. Now, that's about the time that Isaac and Jacob were living in the Holy Land, in Canaan at the time. Um, they tested the DNA, extracted DNA, sampled it, and then they tested 90 volunteers from modern-day Lebanon. And they found that uh, they shared about 90% of the genetic material, genetic markers, with these ancient Canaanites. And so the conclusion reached by these re researchers was that, well, the Bible was wrong because the Bible says the Canaanites were annihilated. So the Bible was wrong. Except that the Bible doesn't say that the Israelites annihilated the Canaanites. In fact, it says exactly the opposite. Read Judges 1, verses 27 through 33. And then Judges 2, verses 1 through 3. The Bible explicitly says the tribe of Manasseh couldn't push out the Canaanites, so they lived among them. The tribe of Dan got pushed out by the Amorites, so they had to move. And these other tribes, you know, tribe of Asher. And, and, and so the Israelites could not push out the Canaanites, and so they, they made them serve as forced labor, but they lived among the Canaanites. The Canaanites lived among them. And then in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the angel of the Lord, which, by the way, the angel of Yahweh, that's a Christophany, okay, that's Jesus in the Old Testament, shows up and says, because you didn't push him out, I'm going to leave them here, these Canaanites, to, to be a thorn in your side, and their gods will be a snare to you. And the Israelites cried because they realized they had not 
done what God had asked them to do. Yes, God asked them, commanded them, actually, to go in and push out the Canaanites because of the wicked practices of the Canaanites, the detestable things that they were doing, but they didn't. And so for New Scientist and Science Magazine and the independent newspaper in the UK to cite this as proof that the biblical account of the Canaanites, we found the ancient Canaanites. Well, no kidding. The Bible never said that they were exterminated. Apparently, there isn't enough fake news from the world of politics today that the science realm has to go back 3,700 years to dig up some old fake news. So just remember, just because something gets published in a mainstream publication, read with discernment, compare it against the scriptures. Now, I'm just astonished because at le- at this second story about the Canaanites is, is so obviously debunked that I'm amazed that anybody, that, that it got published in any of these mainstream publications. What it shows is how secular our world has become because it takes about a two-minute search on any electronic Bible software or any website like Blue Letter Bible or faithlife.com to just search the word Canaanite. It takes two minutes to look. And they didn't. So eager were they to bash the Bible that they got caught. So anyway, I've been tweeting that out just a bit, just to try to embarrass some uh, mainstream reporters it, like they probably care. Anyway. Uh, Coming up in the next 90 days, we've got uh, several conferences that Sharon and I are honored to be a part of. I'll just go through through them very quickly so as to not um, drag this out any any longer. Uh, The Sign in the Heavenlies Conference coming to Boise, Idaho, August 18th through the 20th. Still room there if you'd like to attend and save $20 off the registration. Use the promo code GILBERT20. That's GILBERT20. Uh, Dr. Michael Lake, L.A. Marzulli. Pastor Carl Gallups, many others will be there. Again, August 18th through the 20th, the Sign in the Heavenlies Conference in Boise, Idaho. If you can stick around through Monday, it'll be awesome. We're taking a caravan up to the Continental Divide to watch the total eclipse of the sun. The True Legends Conference in Branson, September 15th through the 17th, that is sold out. But you can still get in on the live streaming. Uh, Live streaming available, by the way, um, at the Sign in the Heavenlies Conference as well. Uh, HearTheWatchmen.com is the website for that. HearTheWatchmen.com. The True Legends Conference, uh, a sellout. 3,000 seats. The Mansion Theater will be full that uh, weekend in September. But you can watch Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, L.A. Marsuli, Timothy Alberino, Dr. Michael Lake, and me, uh, Pastor David Langford, Henry Groover, Anselm P. Rambla. Uh, The live video stream available uh, Log on to gen6conferences.com for that one, gen6conferences.com. And then 33 Bible scholars, uh, geopolitics experts, and um, uh, archaeologists descend on Norman, Oklahoma. That's just outside Oklahoma City, October 13th through the 15th. Still room there. The conference at the Embassy Suites Hotel, a great facility. Uh, register at prophecywatchers.com, and they've also got live video streaming for that as well, prophecywatchers.com. Check out our weekly Bible study, Gilbert House Fellowship. You'll find a new one-hour study as we go through the Bible in chronological order posted at gilberthouse.org. All the archives going back to Genesis 1-1 are there as well. Uh, You'll also find my audio book, the audio version of my novel, The God Conspiracy, posted to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert. About 30 episodes maybe 28. I forget how many. It's been a while since I recorded it. But uh, anyway, you'll find it available free. Listen to the novel for free. YouTube.com slash Derek Gilbert. Give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you find our podcast. And of course, A View from the Bunker is available wherever fine podcasts are sold. It's a production of Gilbert House, released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The opening theme is by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com. The opening announcer is DC Good. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. <laughs>